Amen. Hallelujah. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful day, Father. We just want to say thank you, Father God, for life today. Thank you for waking us up and keeping us, Father. Thank you for, Lord, I like what those of old said, waking us up this morning, our right mind and our right spirit, Father God, a mind that desire to serve you, Father God, a mind that desire to know you more, the mind that desire to serve your people, Father God, and not ourselves. Father God, we thank you for the hunger that you placed inside of us. For you, Father God, and the, the hunger and thirst after you, Father God, like a deer panteth after water. We thank you that we are your servants, your believers, those that you trust with the gospel. Father God, that pertaining to life, Father God, that we may demonstrate that gospel to your people in love and, and demonstration, Father God, and the fruits that we bear. And Father God, we come before you, Father God, first ask you to forgive us of our sins, everything that we've done, Father God, and any trespasses, Father God. And we ask you to forgive us right now for even the things that we didn't know that we did and offend, Father God, anything that would have separated us from you and your people your family, Father God. We ask you to forgive those who have sinned and trespassed against us, Father God, creating us this morning a, a new heart and renew a right spirit in us, Father God. Lord, we cast out everything, Father God, that would keep us from hearing your word this morning. Father God, we, we open our hearts. The Holy Spirit that is within us, we say, minister to us, Holy Spirit. Give us the words of God. Give us the word of our Father, Father God, that we may grow up, continue to grow up, Father God, in that full stature of Christ. Father God, that nothing in this world, Father God, will keep us or, or knock us off kilter in any way, Father God. We thank you. And Father God, commune with us this day, Father God. Let your word be our life, Father God. Give us what you will have us to hear, Father God. Let my mouth speak nothing but that, Father God. Help us to hear, open our hearts and our minds and our spirits to let that word be engrafted in us, Father God, that we may hear and do. And we thank you, Father. We praise you. Anyone, Father God, that's downcast this morning, Father God, we pray for that anyone that needs you in the body, we all need you, first of all, Father. And we ask you to just minister to our hearts, to our spirit, to our mind, to our soul this morning, Father God. We thank you. We love you in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. I'm very excited about the word this morning. It's not the word that I thought I was going to minister. <laughs> I had uh, spent like a month uh, preparing for another word. I think that we will get to hear hopefully next week if God's willing, but um, wanted to minister on following God's compass and what God has put before us, but that mess is going to be next week. So I uh, <clears throat> encourage you to tune in and, and, and to that, but beforehand, God wanted me about two days ago he kind of changed that in my spirit and wanted me to just encourage everyone so this message it may sound a little rough sometimes may sound a little hard it's not it's really not meant to offend but it's actually but to encourage you and i in who we really are and to kind of reiterate our purpose because sometimes in this life that we live we can as christians we get kind of tied up you know we can kind of get lost in the struggle of this world and we kind of you know, allow events and things to kind of pull us away from that path that God has ordained for us before he even created the earth. And we're going to hear about that next week. But before then, we got the Holy Spirit going to encourage us in who we really are. So if you hear anything in this message, and it's probably not going to be that long, I don't know, that's up to the Holy Spirit. But, you know, I don't, don't get be offended, but sometimes you need to check. We need to check ourselves. If something don't apply to you, hey, let it go over your head. But this is a word of encouragement. No matter how it sounds, a word of encouragement, just to reiterate who we are in Christ. And so we won't get lost in the shuffle of this world. So the title of this message, pre-message towards going towards following the compass of God is don't follow the trend. Don't follow the trend. If you look in this world today, you see. The world is full of trends and not just in the physical world. We're not talking about just uh, the Internet and, and, and talking about, you know, the, the social media, which is, is, you know, I hate to say it. I listened to some pastors this week and it seemed like everybody's following a trend. And one person jump on the train, the train to go on duration. Everybody tends to jump on that train. We've seen that in ministry in the past. If one ministry is doing one thing, you know, one ministry see that. You know, that may not be what God has called you to do or us to do at KCM. 
And then we create all these groups and these trends and we're trying to follow this group, we're trying to follow somebody out West and out East Coast and in Colombia. And, and, and that's not what God called us to do. We're going to understand, and you already know that has been preached by so many in the ministry about who we are and whom we are. And, and, and hopefully we'll be able to get into that, but I tell you, but don't follow the trend. Now, trend is a, a, and I'm going to take my time with this. And I, you know, I love definitions, but I just want to understand you, us to understand me to understand what it is. A trend. Now, again, we're not talking about just physical trends on Facebook and all this stuff, talking about that too, but we're talking about even spiritual trends that people will come, you know, I, I, and we're going to get in that because I've learned in following these trends, sometimes as people, we get so concerned about who we are and we forget whom we are. And I, I don't want to get into that, but you see it in the children of Israel, you know, God's chose a people to represent him and they knew who they were, but they kept forgetting whom they were and whom they belong. They belong to God. So God said, not just who you are that matters, it's whom you are, who you belong to. You have to represent me, God, Christ. The God, Christ was with God, even in the Old Testament, in the Holy Spirit, you see demonstrated. And as a people, you know, we're keen about who we are. And it's great to know who we are. You know, but we can't make the same mistakes as the people of old did. Our ancestors, they're our ancestors. And I always, you know, they got down to 12 tribes and, and, and we know who tribe, we can trace it. You know, I'm talking about them. You know, and, 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 and they said, well, I'm of, of a tribe of Benjamin. I'm try and, and God said, well, if you're of that tribe, why don't you behave as if you belong to the one who called you and placed you in that tribe? And as people, we do that. And I didn't mean to go there, but sometimes, you know, we got to remember, uh, it's good to know who we are. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. But if I'm that, I can't forget who called you and I into that. And whom do we belong? And whom do we belong? They actually dictate, and I'm going to use that word, dictate how we should behave in the who. Because you see the children of Israel, I mean, you know, they, they knew who they was, but my God, a lot of them got wiped out. They didn't even go into the promise. Generations of, of people. They still was God's chosen, but that, that didn't mean anything. God said, no, you understand who you are, but do you understand whom you are? Didn't mean to go there, but we'll get into that later if the Holy Spirit tarries that. So a trend, going back to a trend that we should not follow a trend, don't follow a trend. A trend is a general direction in which something is developing or changing. A general direction in whom something or someone, something is developing or changing. A trend can be a fashion. Like a clothesline, <clears throat> a latest dance. It could be a fashion, a vogue, a style, a mode, a craze, a mania, a rage, a fad, a thing. All these are trends. Change that now those are nouns. General direction of what something is developing or changing. And then this verb is a change or development or develop in a general direction. It means to move, to go, to head in the direction, a drift, a gravitation or to gravitate, a swing, a turn, an incline, a lean or a veer towards something. That's the verb. Notice I say a trend is also a fad. And a fad is a style or activity that suddenly becomes popular, but which usually does not stay popular very long. Now that came from the dictionary, Wikipedia. That a style or activity that suddenly, we, like, like we didn't know that suddenly becomes popular. <laughs> but which usually does not stay popular for very long. Now, I've, I've, I don't know about y'all, but I've been in ministry and, you know, you see things come and go. And sometimes you see people come and go because they're following a, a trend or a fad. They're running over here, running over that church. Oh, Holy Spirit over here. Oh, the healing over there. Oh, prosperity over there. Oh, you got to go to this conference to get that fast trend. We've all lived through them. And I know when I'm ministering, you guys thinking back, you say, yeah. 
Been there, done that. Some of you got the t-shirt. We all got a t-shirt somewhere, don't we pass it? <laughs> I tell you. A fad or trend is any form of a collective behavior that develops within a culture. Now, this could be a physical culture, spiritual culture. A fad or trend is any form of collective behavior. Y'all know, because if you run that way, you want everybody to run with you. And sometimes we know God may not tell us to run, but because somebody else run it, we all want to run. So a collective behavior that develops within a culture, a generation or social group. And I tell you, that generation thing, the world got that down. You know, now you're the X generation. Now they got the Z generation. My God, try to call my grandkids the Z. Hey, I tell you, you ain't that. You still a child of God. And now then we in church, we had a Joshua generation. I never understood what that was. You know, it, I'm, I'm sorry. Moving on, Pastor. But they do that in church. You know, that now, and now we are the Joshua generation. We are that generation. And, and, and the fads and the trends that come about. Generational social groups in which a group of people enthusiastically follow an impulse for a short time. And I've seen that. I've seen that in some time in the youth in church. You know, they go through these, these, these waves. And y'all say, and, and adults do the same thing. But a short period of time, fads are objects or behaviors that achieve short-lived popularity, but they fade away. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead of it real quick. I'm, I'm a, one, one more. See, God says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. Matter of fact, he says, I, I don't change. Now, when he says that, he's saying that, you know, that circumstances don't move me. Tricks, surprises. <laughs> you can't surprise God. <laughs> Nothing can cause him to abandon the truth. He don't follow the crowds. He, don't, he doesn't follow the trends. He don't follow what's trending today. God is not moved by that. But we're going to learn in this message, God tell us we should be the same way. And we're going to talk about that, what it means to be ye holy for I am holy. The same attributes that he has, we're supposed to have and demonstrate as his believers. I like this. A practice or interest followed for a time with exaggerated zeal. I got to say that again. Ex a practice or interest is followed for a time with exaggerated zeal. Paul talks about that too in the message. I don't know if we're going to get there, but there can be an exaggerate. You're hitting the ground running. Every, you're running in church, but nobody know why you're running. You could be trying to run off a demon. I don't know. Something may be chasing you, but you, you know, it's just exaggerated zeal. You're doing it because somebody else doing it. You know, I come to church because Pastor Ed, I want to see Pastor Ed see me in church. Well, I go there because I'm, I'm Charles Marsh friend, and I, I, I just want to, to let everybody know I'm with him. So if I hang with him, I, I, they'll think I'm a Christian too. See, but I'm exaggerating. I don't really have a relationship with God. I have a relationship with Christ. I'm just trying to hang around Christians so it appear that I'm in the kingdom too. That is appear that I'm whole. That appear that I'm following Christ. See, but you will find that out. You and I will find that out because then when things in the world, these trends come and, and, and these things become popular, you know, these for a short period of time, we, we ain't gonna run behind everything. But sometimes you do see Christians run behind stuff. You're like, hold brother, hold up. Did God tell you to? And then they scratch in the head and say, I don't know. How, how did you get here? How did you get in the place? Well, you were following a trend. Well, that's not God. So don't follow the trend. Don't forget who and whom ye are and the true purpose that God put us here on this earth. And God knows that sometimes with the things in life, we can forget that. So let's start in Ephesians 4. We got two whole chapters to read this morning. <clears throat> and I think that's going to kind of put us off in where we want to go. Ephesians chapter 4. Now, this has been ministered. Pastor, I'm going to get a little water here. <clears throat> 
a couple weeks ago, Pastor Ian went over that again. We was following Galatians. Mother Eva hit that, the Joneses, everybody. So not to forget who we are and whom we are and our true purpose on the earth as believers. So Pastor Ed ministered this while about the conduct of, of, of saints. <laughs> believers, you're in the kingdom. This, this is why you're there. And I'm going to read, if you don't mind, in the Amplify. <clears throat> okay? And it says, Paul here, he said, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, appeal to you and beg you to walk, which is to lead a life worthy of the divine calling to which you have been called. Now, this means with behavior that is a credit to the summons that God of God's service. That means if you're called by God, don't forget who called you and how you should be behaving yourself. He matter of fact, he said, I beg you, I appeal to you. Don't forget your calling that God called you, not man. Because man calling for you is changed. Sometimes they want this, then they want that. But he said, don't forget who called you and the service that you're supposed to be rendering unto him. He said, living as becomes you. With complete loneliness of mind, which is humility and weakness, unselfishness, gentleness, mildness, with patience, bearing with one another, and making allowance because you love one another. Oh my God, sometimes we can forget about that. And I like what uh, Pastor went over a few Wednesday night ago that, you know, if, if, we, if we are in Christ, and Brother John, if we are in Christ, that we have no time of opportunity that we should step aside and not allow the Holy Spirit to reign in our lives. And in our circumstances, you know, we don't, oh, well, well, they made me mad, so this is what I'm going to do. You know, we should always consult the Holy Spirit that we're in us because the power of God is within us to help us that we can live a sinless life. Oh, no, I can't. Oh, yes, you can. All you got to do is rely on trusting that Holy Spirit that is within us. And when we make our decisions, <laughs> They'll always be right. But do we go to God before we do anything and say, okay, God, should I act this way, that way? I don't think God just give us the opportunity just to act any old way. But say it's here because we love one another that we have this mild, this gent gentleness, and, and this selflessness. Be in, in chapter, verse three. Be eager and strive earnestly to guard and keep the harmony and oneness of, and it says the produced by the spirit in the binding power of peace. So we're supposed to be striving to keep that, that unity. And it says in four, this is what keeps us together. There's one body, which is a church. There's one spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. Even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, if that's not unity, I don't know what unity is. In other words, you ain't got somebody running off on the side like, uh, and I, when I was reading, I thought about like the, 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 the cowboys when they herding the cattle. And y'all always got one cow, a calf just want to just go off by themselves and they think that everybody going to follow them. But the cowboy, and I saw that as the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would go and arrest them and say, come on back to the herd. Come, come, come. And you may, I've been there. You know, I, oh, I think I know, you know, the Holy Spirit gave me a revelation that he ain't gave you, so I, I, I'm over here, I'm special. And the Holy Spirit said, wait a minute, Parker, there's one spirit. So if the Holy Spirit actually told you that and revealed that to you, why come he ain't told everybody else? Hey, hey God got respect to persons? I'm going to leave that alone. But there's call, it's called unity by the Spirit. That means the Holy Spirit, as we, we read in Galatians, should be governing us all. There's only one governor. Now you can run off and govern by yourself. The Holy Spirit, like that cow and, 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 and like the cow, will real come, but he ain't going to make you come back. He'll prod you. He'll say, hey, you know, come on back to the herd. He may even bring out a whip like I saw him doing and pop it by your ear. But some of us, you know, we, no, nah, that's the devil. Get, get away from me, Satan. And the Holy Spirit said, no, nah, you need to get back to the fold. There's unity in the body. Oh, Lord, I'm going to leave that. Um, let's go to six. One God and Father of all, who is above all, you and even our thoughts, 
and through all and in all, which means the same God, same Holy Spirit that's working through each and every one of us, bringing about the same, the same end or purpose. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Now, remember that grace now, that grace is the power of God is working in us. Every one of us is given a measure of grace. Right? People call it unmerited favor, but it's that power of God that he gives us to, to bring, bring about the, the, the will and the purpose that he's sent us to. We're going to see that. Wherefore, he said, when he ascended up on high, you know what? I jumped over from that Amplified and King James, but that's all right. We'll go there. So we are in verse, I'm um, sorry about that. We in verse seven. Let's go back to seven. <laughs> Yet grace, God unmerited favor, was given to each of us individually, not discriminatingly, but in different or in different ways in production to the measure of the Christ, of Christ, Christ's gift. So God gave each one of us a measure of faith and grace. We're going to see that grace and faith later on. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he led captivities. He kept the captivity captive. He, uh, he led a train of vanquished foes, and he bestowed gifts on men. But he ascended. Now, that can't, now what can this he ascended mean but that he had previously descended from the heights of heaven until the depths, the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the very same as he who also had ascended high above all the heavens, that he, his presence, might fill all things, the whole universe, from the lowest to the highest. So all this talks about how he freed us. We were the captive. We were the captive in the sin, and, and God himself came from heaven. He descended He's the same God that walked upon this earth, but also went to hell. He died, freed us even from sin and death. The same God. And he did that so all of us, it said that all of us in the whole universe will be filled and be put under his rule. But it's talking about here how God freed us. 11. And his gifts were buried which means he gave us certain gifts. He himself appointed and gave men to us. Some of the, some was apostles, some prophets. I, I'm, I'm going to jump over, forgive me, in the King James of this, because I like the way it reads a little bit better. Forgive me. <clears throat> in 11. And he gave some apostles. These are the gifts he gave to the church, to you and I. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists these gifts that he gave to the church, some pastors, some teachers. And we already heard this. We know this. For Why did he give these gifts? For the perfecting of the saints, you and I, for the work of the ministry, which God called each and every one of us to do, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And it says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the perfect man, unto a measure of a stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, we, men and I already minister about that. So God don't want one to be here, one to be there, you know, Pastor Mitch, Pastor Dave, Sister Lee, no, no, we're all in that same, because there's only one body, one spirit, one, one Lord that's in us all, working through us all. So he want all of us here to say he want us to become mature in Christ. And this is why 14, talking about these fads and these trends, that we went henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive you. So this is why he gave us the five points. We're growing up together, saints. So that when these trends come, these fasts come, even in the church, that we won't be drawn away. You know, you, you won't have to, you know, the, the Bible said to call on the elders of the church when you get sick. You ain't got to get online and get a prayer call. You ain't got to get no oil from Jerusalem. I'm going to leave that alone. But all that, see, it's in the church, too. We're not talking about fads of the world. We're talking about more so in the church. And it says in 15, 
by speaking the truth in love, we all may grow up unto him in all things. Well, I'm not there yet in this area, but guess what? Keep striving. Keep growing. Keep having faith in God. And allow God, open up so God would touch every area of your life as Christians so that we will be a mature in growth in all things. Because, you know, some of us, you know, some things you just can't bring up, some things you just can't talk about. You know, if you do this, you're going to, you know, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to tick him off a little bit. You know, I, I avoid that subject. Christians. And I know all of us, we have some areas of our lives that sometimes, you know, we ain't let God touch it. It's a little tender, matter of fact, even if somebody preach on it. You know, well, you know, uh, don't don't go there, Pastor. Eh? You know, yeah. I'm gonna leave that alone. Okay, go there. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him, Christ now, in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, you and I, is fitly joined together and compacted, and that which every joint supplied according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So each of us should be supplying even the lack that we have in one another's lives that we be, well, see, if, if, if that's that, maybe that iron shopping iron. See, I, I may not need, didn't know how to treat my wife a certain way, but see, if I hang around Chuck and Pastor Ed and Joan and Carlos long enough and I see the way they treat, you know, now they're edifying me and I'm picking fruit from them. And now I know how to act. And I say, yeah, that, I, I need to do, I need to love my wife more. I need to do this more. I need to do that more. I need to behave a certain way. You know, if, if, I'm, if I'm hanging with someone and, 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 and you know, with Iman, and Iman is acting all nice and, and calm because somebody walk up and offend us. And I'm the person that loved to go off. You know, I draw and it, it, he edifies me in love. He said, well, you know, Parker, we don't have to do that. You know, God called us to demonstrate his love. So each part of the body, according to the effectual work into the measure, and the measure, remember what God has given each and every one of us of every part, make it increase. It called to grow. The body grow and the body edifies itself. I'm going to move on because I, all that been preached to you already. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth Walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. All right, going back to that uh, definition, it says exaggerated zeal, the vanity of their mind. I'm gonna leave that alone. Having the having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. My God. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, I don't want that to be me. By being ignorant, things that I, I just don't want to know, that is in me because of the blindness of my heart. I, I don't want God to, to go there. I'm going to move on from that. Who being past feeling, have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness and greediness. I'm going to read 19 and amplify it, if you don't mind. I'm going to go read 18 and 19. It says, the more understanding is darkened and their reasoning is beclouded, they are alienated, estranged, self-banished from the life of God with no share in it. This is because of the ignorance, the want of knowledge and perception, the willful blindness willful blindness that is deep-seated in them due to their hardness of their heart to the insensitivities of their moral nature in their spiritual apathy they have become callous and and past feelings and reckless and have abandoned themselves a prey to unbridledness sensitivity sensuality sorry eager and greedy to indulge in every form of impurity and they're depraved and they and they deprave the, themselves depraved desires may su suggest and demand that means that anything that they so desire in their flesh anything suggested 
They say, okay, I'll go along with that. But he says in 20, but you did not so learn Christ. In other words, you know Christ ain't like that. So like what he said in Galatians, he said, this ain't the Christ that you heard about. Assuming that you have really heard him and been taught by him, as all truth is in Jesus, which is embodied in the pers and personified in him, assuming that you have really heard him. Now that going back, you can, now I'm gonna leave that alone. Leave that alone. Strip yourselves of your former nature, but put off and discard your old un unrenewed self, which characterized your prior or your previous man of life and become corrupt through the lust and desires of that spring from the del from delusion. In other words, you fall in a way that seems to be right. There's a way unto a man that seems to be right, but in the end, it turned out to be death. You really won't follow Christ at all. You're following your own self and what you thought Christ was like. But that's not the Christ that you know. You know Christ, God is a, a loving God. You know Christ is a loving God. You know how the manner in which he behaved himself. But we can behave ourselves in a way that's not like him. And it says here that we deprive ourselves from knowing the truth because we really don't have a relationship with it anyway. But we still, we know that that's not the Christ that we learn. And it says in 23, and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude. That's that daily devotion, that relationship with God, growing in relationship with God. Because if we're not constantly renewed in this, something always going to come along to draw us away from God. There's always going to be somebody to say, well, I think God wants you to do this. Well, if you got a constant, you constantly renewing yourself and your spirit and your mind, fellowship with God, you, God going to tell you what to do. Nobody going to come along and say, well, I think, and I know people, God knows. I'm going to leave that alone, but people have told me that. People have walked up to me in church and said, I believe God, you know, you, you gonna, you, God called you to do this. And it ain't their fault. They had a desire. They had a need. They had an they, they a, a, a error that they need somebody to be in. And I just won't have to be that person. But, you know, me not uh, spending time with God and allowing my not mind to be renewed and, and in my spirit, spirit of my mind, I say, yeah, I, I, I believe, yeah. Because you know, we're always looking for a word. We're always looking for a direction. We're always asking somebody to pray for me and, and direct me. But you know, it says here that God desires for each and every one of us, we just learned to have a relationship with him. We saw that in Galatians. And then it says in 24, and put on a new nature. The regenerate self. Created in God's image. God-like in true righteousness and holiness, and not the fake, not the, the exaggerated zeal. But he wants us to put on the true nature. See, I'm saying this because God reminded me and us, he reminded us who we really are, encouraging us in who we really are, reiterating our true purpose and who we really are in Christ. Because all these things today you see in this time, you know, what a Christian is supposed to be and all this stuff, a lot of it don't line up with the word of God. But we're spending time with God. God gave us gifts. He placed faith in a seed in us that we're going to go to next. That we, and we have to constantly have a relationship with God as believers, that we all will grow up and be mature. That things in this life and in this world won't just pull us away from what God called us to be because there is a thing that we're going to look at a thing that God has called each and every one of us to a purpose. And sometimes we forget about that. God didn't just make me to wake up and go to work and make money to pay bills. There's a purpose on this earth that God created each and every one of us to fulfill. That's what we're striving for. You know, we all want to hear it like the apostle, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And we talked about in the past that God, even before the foundation of the world, God said that we will purpose 
to be in Christ Jesus, to do the good works that God foreordained us to do. So we're not here just living haphazardly, running around to my wheel church and, you know, we're, 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 we're fit, trying to figure out what direction to go in next. No, we already know the direction God has told us to go in. But that's not going to change. No matter what anybody else preach, no matter what you see on TV, no matter what you see trending, forget, it's not going to change. KCM, we know the purpose that God has for us. Do Each believer should know the purpose that God has for them every day when you wake up. And you should go and leave your house every day or whatever you do to, to, to fulfill that purpose. <clears throat> and it says, therefore, <clears throat> 25, that we should reject all falsivity and being, and being done now with it. Things come up false, just reject it. Be done with it. Don't keep going back trying to figure out, you know, should you get, be a part of it? And let everyone express the truth with his neighbor. And we talked about that. Everybody, Brother Stan, you know, Pastor, Susie, even talked about who is your neighbor. That's everybody around you. For we are all parts of one body and members of one of another. And it says here, when angry, do not sin. Conduct of a Christian now. Do not ever let your wrath, your ex exasperation, your fury, your indignation last until the sun goes down. Give it to God. We can't carry it. Now, I learned that personally. Leave no such room or foothold for the devil. And we talked about it in James. We passed it over in James. You know, we don't open the door. We don't leave the door open for Satan to come in in the body of Christ to cause dissension, call division. And it says, give no opportunity to him. He has no power. But we open the door. We, we, we through our anger and rage, we leave a room and foothold for him. And then we blame the devil. Right? The devil, you know, the devil's always running me. And I heard somebody say that this week, and I tell you, it vexed my spirit a little bit. Uh, you know, if you... Lord Jesus, if you always, if the devil always running you and everybody is against you, and I mean, just, and they told me that everywhere I turn, there's the devil, and everybody, close the door. Why are you over there where Satan at? Why are you in his territory? You're not supposed to be over there. Maybe you, there's something that you have done that, that he's there with you because, because ain't nobody else experiencing that. I, I didn't mean to go there, mama. But I know sometimes you get tired of people calling you, oh, pray for me now. The devil's at the end. Leave his camp. Get just, you're not even supposed to be over there. You're supposed to be fulfilling the purpose that God told you to fulfill. But you're over there playing with the devil and want her, Mother Eva to pray for you, to get devil off of you. No, get off the devil. Get off of him. Don't ride him. I don't know where that came from. But praise the Lord in the house. And then it says, I'm sorry, 28. If you're a person that steal, now that could be stealing time, stealing resources. I ain't just talking about going to the store, no smash and grab. Sometimes we're not, you're stealing time from from God and stealing time from people when you should be ministering to people, you should be fellowshipping. But if you're that person, it's always about you. He said, rather let that person be industrious, making an honest living with his own hands so that he may be able to give to those in need. So we're supposed to be givers, not always taking. You know, sometimes we steal time from people. Always got a need that somebody always got to come see about you. You're stealing people's time. Instead of lending a hand, everybody always got to lend a hand to you. Always calling the church for something. Well, we don't have those at KCM. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. But I see them. I see them out there. You know, but they didn't want to, they didn't want to come steal your time. Time for you to go uh, uh, fellowship with, with Pastor Ed, you know, but they want you to come over there by them. And he's he been waiting for you all week. And I can use y'all as an example. Y'all don't do that. And sometimes you got to tell people, so well, hold on a minute. What, what have you prayed about? What, what have you done? You know, you ain't gonna always steal my time. You, you, I can't let you be that thief. You know, because we already dealing with another thief that came to steal and, and kill and destroy. God already defeated him. Now you, now you think he sent you to steal my time. 
I think I definitely leave that alone. <clears throat> 29. It said, let no foul or polluting language or evil word, nor knowledge, un un sorry, no unwholesome or wor unworthy talking ever come out of ever, ever come out of your mouth. But only such speech what is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others and is feeding to the need and every occasion that it may be blessed and give grace, which is God's favor to those who hear it. We should be blessing others. And I'm going to hurry up because we got to move on. And, and it says here in 30, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not offend or vex or sadden him. By whom you were sealed. Understand, it's a mark branded as God's own. We're secured for the day of redemption of final deliverance through Christ from, from evil and the consequences of sin. So how do we grieve the Holy Spirit when we do those things that he just mentioned that we should not do? We're not loving. We're not doing as we should. We're grieving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is trying to operate and how it's trying to live through each and every one of us. If it's trying to demonstrate the purpose of God through each and every one, it's communing with us. It's, it's, it's telling us how to behave in every situation. But we grieve the Holy Spirit. We suppress it. We know we're supposed to do right about this thing. But you know what? I, I, I know, God, what you want me to do. But I, I, just, I just can't bless that person this time. I'm tired of them. I, I just can't show your love to them right now. They, they hurt me in the past. And I told them I, I, told them I was going to get them. And the Holy Spirit said, no, nah, this is a great opportunity for you to show the love of God. But you know what? I ain't No. Nah, I know all that, you know, speaking good things and blessing one another, but no, I ain't doing that. He hurt me. You know, remember what he said to my wife? I'm going to move on from that. 31, let all bitterness and indignation and wrath, passion, rage, bad temper and resentment, anger, animosity and quarreling, brawling, clamoring, contention and slander, evil speaking, abusive and blasphemous language be abandoned banished from you with all malice, spite, ill, will, or baseness of any kind. Now, he tells us to get rid of all that stuff. And he says, and become useful and helpful and kind to one another, tenderhearted, passionate, understanding, lovinghearted, forgiving one another, readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. So that just is, just read that, had to go through it, the conduct of the say, how we should behave in ourselves. What are we becoming? Not forgetting who we are, but we're, we're in this thing, that case that we're, we're trying to grow up, that we all be mature in Christ, that Christ will be mature in every era of life. And I don't know about you, I'm still working on some things, but thank God for the fivefold ministry. Thank God for the saints that we're all one, that we're all growing in one. That, 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 that we're edifying one another. And if anybody in the body is not edifying you, get away from them. If somebody's always tearing you down, pointing out your, your, your negative points and, and trying to make you feel that, you know, you're less than them, get away from them. And I see that in other ministries. You no, know, uh, well, only, that's only for the saints. That's only for the, the elders of the church. No, 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 get away from them. Same God and not everybody. You know, you could pray just as fervent than anybody else in the church. You may not spit. You may not do a lot of stuff that everybody else do. You, you may not can pray for an hour, but will you do what Christ has called you to do? When you spend your time with God, God will tell you what you are or are not doing right. You know, and I have people to do me that way. You know, I pray for 15, 20 minutes in a month. Bro, you ain't praying for an hour? And I said, my God, I, I, I'm just doing what God told me to do. Instead of saying, boy, you, you get at least you're doing something. I mean, praise God. What, what God doing in your life? Oh, but you ain't doing like me. Huh? I, well, we ain't got that in our church. I'm just giving an example. <clears throat> Let's go real quick to 1 Corinthians. My God, I'm not going to be coming close to finishing. Lord, have mercy. And we got to move on next week. <sighs> First Corinthians chapter 15 talks about don't forget 
that this life in the body is not the end. Now, I know sometimes we, we forget about that. We're not just living this life. But in this life, things can happen that will actually affect our eternity. We're not living just for this life. We're not here to get all we can and, and party like it's 1999. Had to throw a little Jones in there. But this, what we do in this life will affect, we're not here. This is not our home. I'm just reminding you, remember this word is to encourage, not to offend. I know we got nice cars, nice homes and all that kind of stuff. We got a beautiful family and grandkid. They, all that going to pass away. If you don't believe me, go back and pull up revelations that pastor did a couple of months ago. All that you see, this Babylonian system, it will be done away with. I know we love it. We like it. We're comfortable. It's nice. But don't let what you do here, what you have here, keep you from eternity. Because we were made, we were created to be eternal beings. And we will be eternal beings. You're going to spend it somewhere. And I know as Christians, sometimes I see why God brought this up. We forget about that. I, I have to read through this really quick. Are we going to... Uh, <clears throat> now, I know this is going to sound a lot, but I I'm going to read through this whole chapter. We're going to come back and we're going to kind of identify a few things. And I want you to go back and read through it yourself, too. <clears throat> so Paul here, he said in 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he said, and now let me remind you, since it seemed to escape from you, brethren of the gospel, Christians, believers, let me remind you something about the good titles of salvation, which I proclaim to you, which you welcome and accepted, and upon which, which of your faith rests, and which your faith rests. So let me remind you about the gospel. Let me write, 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 remind you about where your salvation really rests. Let me remind you what it's all about. <clears throat> And he says, and two, by which you were saved, if you hold fast and keep firmly what I preach to you, unless you believe at first without effect and all for nothing. Now, if you were just believing because you were following a fad or a craze, or you were just being trendy because everybody else were around it, maybe you, <laughs> that's why you forgot this gospel, because you weren't really, you know, deep rooted and grounded. <clears throat> So he's talking about here, we're going to see, he's talking about the unadulterated gospel. Not another. He reminded them about the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, for I passed on to you, <clears throat> first of all, what I also have received, that Christ the Messiah, the anointed one, died for your sins, for our sins, in accordance with what the scripture foretold. Talking about just the gospel, he reminded them of that he was buried, <clears throat> that he rose on the third day, as the scripture foretold, and also that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve, then later he showed himself to more than 500 brethren at one time, the majority of whom are still alive, but have, some have fallen asleep or in death. Afterwards, <clears throat> he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one prematurely and born dead, which means no better than the unperfected fetus among living men. For I am the least worthy of the apostles who am, who am not fit or deserving to be called an apostle because I once wronged and persecuted and pursued and molested the church of God, oppressing it, with cruelty and violence. Everybody knows his history. But by the grace, God still gave him grace, the unmerited favor and blessing. He still gave him grace and the power to, for him to carry out that purpose that God had planted in his life. Matter of fact, remember, he even came back and said, I, I understand now after it, 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 his, his illumination that God, God had his hand on me since birth. I just was doing the wrong thing. I was just pulled away. And by the grace and merit of favor and blessing of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not found to be 
for nothing, fruitless and without effect. In fact, it worked harder than all. I work, sorry, in fact, I work harder than all of them, which means the, all the apostles, though it was not I, really I, but the grace that, again, that unmerited favor, that power that God gave him, but the grace of God, which was in me. So whether then it was I or they, talking about the other apostles, but this is what we preach, and this is what we believe what you adhere to, trust and rely on. So he's going back, reminding them about the gospel of Jesus Christ because they seem to have forgotten about it because they were being pulled away by other things. And they were doing things that they weren't supposed to quite do. So he's reminding us the same way, but he's saying 12, but now if Christ the Messiah is preached as raised from the dead, now we're going to get in there. We're going to read through this and then come back and talk about it. But now Christ the Messiah is preached as raised from the dead. How is it that some of you that there say that there is no resurrection of the dead? They're talking to believers here now. They've gotten so far away from the truth that they're right here preaching now. You know, he got, is, is Christ raised from the dead? Now we're going to see why. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not risen. And if Christ has not risen, then our preaching is in vain. It amounts to nothing. And your faith is devoid of truth and is fruitless, which means without effect. It's empty. It's imaginary. It's unfounded. You would just fall in the fast. We are even, dis we are even discovered to be misrepresenting God, for we testified of him that he raised Christ from whom whom he did not raise, in case it is true that the dead are not raised. In other words, they was living. We're going to see that. As, and now we can claim that Christ isn't raised. See, we ain't got to worry about us being raised. So in other words, there's no life. There's no judgment after death in the body. So if Christ was not raised, we ain't got to be worried about what they're talking about in Revelation. We ain't got to be talking about being raised up for judgment. And Christ's going to judge what we do here. All we got to do is run around and act like we're Christian. Have a good time. We ain't got to worry about the afterlife. We got to worry about the life after this life. We just got to worry about being good Christians here, you know, going to church and doing all this good stuff and just purpose in our heart what we want to do. Get to that a little later. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is mere delusion. It's futile, fruitless. And you are still in your sins under the control and penalty of sin. Thank God we're not. And further, those you have died, and further, those who have died in uh, spiritual fellowship and union with Christ have perished or are lost. If we are in 19, if we who are abiding in Christ have hope alone in this life, and that is all, then we are all people most miserable and to be pitied. So we're going to talk about here, there is life after this life. If we're just thinking that, you know, God just come to bless us here on this earth, because there's no resurrection of the dead, there's no kingdom that coming down from heaven that which we are part of that will reign forever. And we just live in this life kind of uh, haphazardly, kind of, it's, 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 it's futile. Because there is no life after this. We just go in the grave and we just stay there. We dead. And then death will have victory over us. So when we dead, that's it. But it said in 20, wait a minute. But the fact is that Christ the Messiah has been raised from the dead and he became the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep in death. Man, if, if Christ raised from the dead, see, he's the first fruit, that means we all going to be raised from the dead. He's just the first. For since it was through a man that death came into the world, it is also through a man that the resurrection of the dead has come. And just as because of their union of nature in Adam, all people die. So also by sorry, so also 
by the union, their union with Christ, we are being made alive. But each in his own rank and turn, then those who are Christ own will be resurrected at his coming. After that, now this is what Pastor Ed was talking about in Revelation, so this is just a recap. After that comes the end, the completion. When he delivered over the kingdoms of God, of the kingdom to God, the Father, after rendering inoperative and abandoning every other rule and every authority and power, he talked about that. That God will come back and, and, and take everything back. It'll be under his authority and his rule. Remember Revelation. For Christ must be the king and reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So Christ will reign until God put all of his enemies under his feet. And it says the last enemy to be subdued and abolished is death. And not to jump ahead, but you know, if we're crucified, it talk about we're crucified with Christ. Now we live with him. Death has no reign over us. So there is a life after this life. Christ is alive and we will be alive after this physical death. For he, the father, has put all things in subjection under his, his or Christ's feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection under him, it is evident that he, Christ himself, is, has accept, is accepted who does the subjected and all things uh, things to him. However, when everything is subject to him, when the son himself will also subject himself to the father who put all things under him so that God may be all in all, be everything and everyone supreme and indwelling and controlling fact of life. That means that we are in Christ. We're also in God. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. I'm going to go on so we can get somewhere. Otherwise, what do people mean by saying to themselves that they're baptized in behalf of the dead? If the dead are not really raised at all, we are people baptized for them. I mean, sorry, why are people baptized for them then? For that matter, why do I live dangerously? He's saying here and run the risk that I'm running in pair every hour. And why am I living for Christ? Why am I being persecuted for Christ if, 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 if Jesus was not raised and we don't have any life in him and not in this life, but in afterlife? I assure you by the pride which I have in you and in fellowship and union with Christ Jesus our Lord that I die daily. I face death every day and die to self. So the, the death that he's talking about here that we also go through, we die to self our own self-will, our own self-desire, the way we want to go. He said, I put that aside because I'm, we talked about, boy, I'm crucified with Christ. I want to live in Christ, the same life that Christ have to be resurrected with him. I also have to die in my flesh. I have to follow him. I have to trust, the trust and rely in Christ. And I'm going to be minister that a long time ago at the Unity Chapel, that we have to die. Remember that, Miss Kathy. Kathy like that. We have to die daily in this flesh, our own desire. What we think is right, we have to die. You know, the way I want to behave and the way I want to just go off and when you uh, may offend me, I have to die in my flesh. I have to put on the new man. I have to be renewed in Christ. You know, he told Nicodemus in order to be, to, to, to be, to, to experience the kingdom, you got to be born again. Every man has to die of this flesh, but you have to be resurrected by the spirit in Christ. So we die to self daily. We have to suppress that, that that he was talking about before him, that that old man that just don't want to die. Our own behaviors, our own lifestyle that he just expressed. Have to get away from that. Have to subdue that. Allow the power of God and the Holy Spirit, that grace that God has given us to live through us daily. We can't suppress the Holy Spirit. And he said that he have to do this daily. We do this daily. And he said, what do I gain if merely from the human viewpoint, I thought, you know, he thought he, he had fought, excuse me, with these human beasts or wild beasts at Ephesus. If the dead are not raised at all, let us eat, drink for tomorrow, we will be dead. In other words, like John would say, let us just party like this 1999. 
if there is no repercussions of my actions, how we live here on earth, if Christ is not raised from the dead, if I don't have to be a new regenerate man to live with Christ forever, if we're not, if, if when we go to the ground and we just die and that's it, we might as well just part like it's 1999 because there's no repercussions for our sin. And sometimes as Christians, we got to remember that. There is repercussions for what we do in this life. When we do not die dead and we do not submit ourselves to Christ, but we want to be expected, we want to be raised with him forever. I'm going to have to stop right there. We got to pick up on that. I didn't even get to a piece of where I want to get to, but we're getting to. We got to finish this chapter. This chapter gonna, it looks like it's kind of complicated, but the Holy Spirit is going to break through and he's going to explain to us what he's meaning here. So we're going to stop right there. And I got to mark that myself. Okay, so I think we stopped at verse 33. Yeah, we'll start back up there and I try to finish next week. I may not get into everything I got the Holy Spirit. We'll, we'll get there in time. Um, amen, but this word has really encouraged you and, and, and not to follow the trend. You see here that Paul was telling them that they have gotten away from Christ. They have gotten away from the very foundation that they knew that they were saved. And some of them were even of delusion that they was around other brothers and sisters. But, you know, perhaps it said here, we just read that maybe you didn't believe in Christ from the beginning. And I hope to God none of us find ourselves there. You know, because sometimes we're just following what our parents did. We really don't, we're not, we don't really have a relationship with Christ. That's why we always got to call somebody else every time something happened in our life. Because we don't know him personally. And sometimes you may, we may forget that, you know, that Christ actually, we forget that the, the, the unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, why he came. He came to restore us back to our original state so we can be with him forever. But he also came that his life would be demonstrated through us. And sometimes following trends and following these fads, it pulls us away from our true identity in Christ. So we're going to see that as we get into that, what God really created us for. And we're going to talk about not just who we are, saying yourself as a believer, but if you know who you are in Christ, you will know of whom you belong to. And we're going to see that we have to behave ourselves like the one who called us. If we're going to see that Christ has given us tools, he's given us not just grace, that power, but he's given us the Holy Spirit to carry out his will, that we can be fruitful on this earth, do the good things that he called us to do, and that will determine how we live eternally. But sometimes as Christians, we may forget that there we are eternal. There is eternal heaven, eternal life waiting for us. And as Pastor Ed went through that in, in, in the revelation, it encouraged me to conduct myself a certain way because I want to be a part of his kingdom. You know, I don't want to be what I just read to live this life and not believe in God and his son, Jesus Christ, and his purpose in which he came. But I'm going to church and I'm acting like I'm a Christian but I really don't believe. I don't have the fruits to demonstrate that I believe that Christ raised from the dead. He's alive and he's alive in me and we will spend eternity with him. So we're just going through the motions. We're not gonna do that. So let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for your word. Father God, we thank you for the gift of grace that you've given each and every one of us, Father, that we may live and do the thing that you purposed us for and created us for, Father God. Lord, we pray that you will bless everyone. Keep us, Father God. Number one, keep us before you. Let our relationship, as the word said, be renewed in our spirit daily. Father God, we pray that as you direct us and your Holy Spirit direct us, 
that we won't quench your Holy Spirit, that we will follow after you, and not after trends, not after things of this world or things that may come up in the church. Father, Father God, but we are free. We're not bound by sin. And Father God, we just thank you that throughout this week, Father God, and every day, Father God, that you would just remind us of our behavior, our conduct, where we're going, Father God, what our end is, Father God, in you. And Father God, what we should be doing on a daily basis, Father God, calls us to continue to grow up in the full stature of Christ, that none of us will be drawn away by any false doctrine or anything that would come and pull us from the purpose of Christ in our lives. We thank you. We honor you, Father God. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. And I gotta stop recording. Where is it recording? Stop. And...